Tonight, a special program from the Ideas Unit of CBC Radio. This evening and next week at this time, we present the two Marfleet Lectures delivered by Professor Marshall McLuhan at the University of Windsor. The subject of these two lectures is Canada in the Electronic Age. And the first, which we are going to hear in a few minutes, is entitled Canada, a Borderline Case. For many years, Professor McLuhan has been on the staff of the Department of English at St. Michael's College, the University of Toronto, and has also accepted the post of Director of the Center for Culture and Technology at the same university. Recently, he has been appointed a visiting professor at Fordham University in the United States. To introduce Marshall McLuhan with a few minutes of comments on his work, style, and message of this lecture is Dr. Eugene McNamara of the Department of English at the University of Windsor, who is presently engaged in editing a collection of Professor McLuhan's many and scattered literary essays. Dr. Eugene McNamara. What I am going to do is impossible. I am going to attempt a commentary on Marshall McLuhan. It is impossible for two reasons. The first is that what he says in his talk, Canada, a borderline case, is itself in the form of a commentary. The second reason is that his style habitually is epigrammatic, terse, packed, elliptical, and pithy. To attempt a commentary would be akin to splitting a nightingale to see what makes it sing. Besides, by the time I would pin one idea down, He's off on another tangent. And the tangents frequently have the richest thought in them. Listening to McLuhan is like being at a mixed media concert or a 17-ring circus. You have to be alert at every moment for the chance remark that electrifies you into thinking, why, of course, which is what makes him our prophet. He tells us what we've always known but never gave utterance or form to. His subject is Canada's future as a frontier nation, using frontier in two senses, on the border of the United States as the frontier of America, in a way, as the U.S. rapidly becomes world-oriented, and frontier in the sense of being in the midst of the new media explosion. He makes a great deal of the do line as being an electronic frontier or borderline. Later on, he will develop how physical frontiers are transformed into symbolic or artistic frontiers. The sense of being a frontiersman, of being in this propitious, advantageous position, enjoyed, for example, by the 19th century Irish over the English, lies now in Canada's lap. If I admit it sounds simple, this is merely positive evidence of what I meant by saying that commenting on McLuhan would do damage to what he has to say. What he has to say is essentially a poem. It is couched in figurative language. It literally teases us out of thought, so that any prosaic attempt to give you a translation may end in pinning down the thought too nicely, giving it a smooth, bland, one-dimensional quality, which it certainly doesn't have in the original. A recent cartoon of a bookstore front with a small sign in the window, McLuhan spoken here, is not only funny, but an acknowledgement that, in his attempts to make us post-1945 folks aware of what has happened to our linear world, he has had to smash up the language and remold it so that once dead rhetoric is alive in fresh forms again, he has literally had to create a new language. McLuhan is, in this sense, a new frontiersman himself. Instead of leading you from one causal point to another, he rides into town like a gunslinger in a Western movie, shooting in all directions at once, shaking up the town, and then he rides out without following up his upset with any explanation. It has always struck me in my own investigations of American literature that what McClure has formulated here, the advantage the outsider has in any culture, or living beside a culture, parallel to it, and to the people who are immersed in it, has been proven time and again in the literary reputations of various people. Walt Whitman, for example, found an enthusiastic audience in England before he was even thought respectable in the U.S. 
and the same was true of Herman Melville. But it has always interested me that two of their contemporaries, who were overwhelmingly enthusiastic and dedicated to their work, were Canadians. In the same way today, Northrop Fry and Marshall McLuhan have this advantage of perspective. Now, the American frontier ended in 1890, after the Battle of Wounded Knee Creek. The U.S. Census Bureau declared officially that there was no longer a land frontier. But it took a long time to die, symbolically. And poetically and mythically, it still isn't dead. The frontier image, or mythos, is so steeped in Americans that, as McLuhan points out, they can't see it. We never see the element we are immersed in. In certain little shops where one can buy immense, blown-up still photos of Humphrey Bogart, Marlon Brando, James Dean, and, oh yes, Mao Zedong, the popular graffiti of the day had been moved off of washroom walls and put on badges. I wonder what Professor McLuhan makes of this phenomena, the underground art of graffiti, for so long restricted to fences and walls, has now become personal and mobile. Perhaps it is another sign of the st steady breaking through of the underground. Nothing is under the counter anymore. There is no pornography, not even the pornography of death, after the loved one was made into a film, and the sick jokes destroyed the last of our taboos, and finally we had, oh, Dad, poor Dad, Mom hung you in the closet, and I'm feeling so sad, which simultaneously assaulted momism and our death pornography. Anyhow... One of these graffiti buttons reads, McLuhan reads books. You know, in the popular mythology, McLuhan has become the prophet of the non-literary world of the future. Books are obsolete is a mild way of rendering McLuhan's ideas into pop form. Well, let me point out, first of all, at this juncture, that in Professor McLuhan's view, the future is very much now, today, the future, what we think of traditionally as the future, might be regarded as the post-future. So also the by now classic New York cartoon, which shows a vacant-eyed imbecile watching television and wearing a sweatshirt lettered, I like Marshall McLuhan, is an expression of this pop image. Whenever one sees discussions of the state of literacy, of the future of the novel and so on, McLuhan's name is used in vain by his famous tagline, the medium is the message, was even quoted by Bob Hope at the end of the Academy Awards presentation ceremonies without a citation of the source. There are two Marshall McLuhan's. One is the man on the button who reads books. The other is the man on the idiot's sweatshirt, the straw man, who was bludgeoned in pop article after pop article. The first is the real McLuhan, who, yes, does read books and has written about the books and who himself writes them. What has interested him is the impact of the new inventions, especially the new media, on the formation of sensibilities. We now have a whole generation who were formed by television. Today, the average kindergartner comes into his classroom with several thousand hours of television time logged in. He has seen war, labor unrest, beauty contests, Ancient films filled with dead people who are as present to him as the live ones. Small wonder that young servicemen in Vietnam, significantly in the cavalry, who are gunners and helicopters, refer to their duty as riding shotgun, as if they were on a Wells Fargo stagecoach and the enemy were hostile Indian, Indians. Surely the prevailing official U.S. attitude in Vietnam closely parallels Colonel Chivington's classic line when he gave instructions to his troops during the Civil War before they descended on a peaceful camp of treaty Indians. Kill them all. Women, children, the aged, all. The children, too? Yes. Because, as the colonel put it, in terms which sound disturbingly contemporary when we think of napalmed innocence, nits breed lice. Only a mythically formed television generation could make that jump from history, however recent it really was, about a hundred years ago, to the present, and not see the differences. 
or contrarywise, not see the implicit parallel. Dominant white men with superior technological resources relentlessly pursuing a more primitive tribal people, utterly committed to the myth. I find Professor McLuhan's concept of the future make that present role of the Canadian artist an exciting and provocative one. As he sees it, the Canadian artist's role is to create an anti-environment, a counter-environment in art objects, which can make the United States environment, which is rapidly spilling out of the borders, available to us. Who can any longer say that Coca-Cola shopping plazas, to say nothing of movies, are uniquely American, now that they are common in France, Italy, Japan, Africa, and apparently in the near future, in Micronesia. Art, as Professor McLuhan puts it, makes a corporate existence available to individuals. Canadian artists are in an advantageous position. They are on the border. They can see two worlds at once. Now, in his second talk, Professor McLuhan will address himself to the benefits to be derived from this divided consciousness. Canada is a borderline case. Her artists, in the creation of a counter-environment, can hold up an uncracked mirror to the American myth. Scotland was England's frontier in the 18th century. There was such an enthusiastic interest in the primitive expressions in art, the folk ballad, the folk epics, that the researchers soon exhausted the authentic resources and had to create literary models. Macpherson's fake epic, Ashen, is probably the best example. Robert Burns, the plowboy poet, followed by a host of milkmaid poets and shoemaker bards, was a kind of 18th century Bob Dylan. It is a kind of truism that when a civilization becomes so involved so gigantic, so fuzzy-edged, and almost impossible to manipulate psychically, or even to get perspective on, it reverts in its art forms to the primitive, to the simple. The resurgence of interest in folk music, primitive painting, and other less genteel forms, like Marlon Brando's leather jacket and James Dean's red jacket, were 1950s-style Steinbeck primitivism, Remember Steinbeck's 1930s idealized truck drivers, Shades of Jimmy Hoffa? But anyway, the 1950s style of primitivism was probably a manifestation of psychic unrest as a result of the U.S.'s growing involvement with the rest of the world. By now, Canada might very well be in the position Scotland was to England in the 18th century. This centennial year draws attention to it. Canada is the site of a world's fair where all the civilizations of the globe gather to create a conglomerate, aggregate, corporate artifact of where they conceive they are, or to put it this way, what state of development they posit for themselves is actually, as well as symbolically, bordering on everywhere. Canada is on the frontier for everybody. There is a passage in Leonard Cohen's latest novel, Beautiful Losers, which illustrates the possibility in somewhat more apocalyptic terms. It is not merely because I am French that I long for an independent Quebec, says the character F who writes from an asylum. It is not merely because I do not want our people to become a quaint drawing on the corner of a tourist map that I long for thick national borders. It is not merely because without independence we will be nothing but a Louisiana of the North, a few good restaurants in a Latin quarter, the only relics of our blood. It is not merely because I know that lofty things like destiny and a rare spirit must be guaranteed by dusty things like flags, armies, and passports. I want to hammer a beautiful colored bruise on the whole American monolith. I want a breathing chimney on the corner of the continent. I want a country to break in half 
so men can learn to break their lives in half. I want history to jump on Canada's spine with sharp skates. I want the edge of a tin can to drink America's throat. I want 200 million to know that everything can be different, any old different. Now, in Cohen's novel, this sort of thing goes on and on and on. But that one sharp and painful image, history jumping on Canada's spine with sharp skates, seems to me a metaphoric statement of Marshall McLuhan's view of Canada's frontier future. Henry James once said, it is a complex fate being an American. I think he was talking about the same kind of frontier existence, being the American abroad. It will be, maybe if even is now, a complex fate being a Canadian. There is one kind of strange situation I find tonight, and that is, I don't know whether to take it, advantage of it, but most of my audience is over my head. And uh, this is a, a rather refreshing change. I have uh, worked on this subject, thought about it for weeks, and I find it's very difficult to think about a Canadian audience as an entity, as a coherent, unified thing. Uh, was it Jean Marchand the other day who said that as a result of his touring of Canada, he decided that Canada is five countries between British Columbia and the Maritimes, five countries. And it's very difficult to address, address five countries simultaneously and uh, I think uh, this is uh, perhaps one of our strengths also. Nature and history seem to have agreed to designate us in Canada uh, for a corporate artistic role. As the USA becomes a world environment through its resources and technology enterprises, Canada takes on the function of making that world environment perceptible to those who occupy it any environment it, it tends to be imperceptible to its users and occupants, except to the degree that counter-environments are created by the artist. A New Yorker cartoon a few months ago showed two fish that had climbed out on the shore. One said to the other, this is where the action is. <laughs> um, a wit has said, we don't know who discovered water, but we're pretty sure it wasn't a fish. The one thing you can never see is the element in which you move. Canada, of course, the land of the dew line, which is part of our invisible environment. It is a frontier of pure information, typical of a variety of frontiers, of which I will have some explanations later, that have emerged in the 20th century and which have altered our entire relation to ourselves and to our world. For the value of a frontier as a sort of interface or complex further of continuing change adds greatly to the powers of human perception and growth. For example, a writer seeking to discern the contours of the Victorian age hit upon this striking approach. Quote, the chief turn of 19th century England was taken about the time a footman at Holland, Holland House opened a door and announced to Mr. Macaulay Macaulay's literary popularity was representative, it was deserved, but his presence among the great Whig families marks an epoch. He was the son of one of the first friends of the Negro, whose honest industry and, industry and philanthropy were darkened by a religion of somber smugness, which almost makes one fancy they loved the Negro for his color and would have turned away from red or yellow men as needlessly gaudy. But his wit and his politics, combined with that dropping of the Puritan tenets, 
but retention of the Puritan tone which marked his class and generation lifted him into a sphere which was utterly opposite to that from which he came. This Whig world, the great new industrial tycoon world, was exclusive, but it was not narrow. It was very difficult for an outsider to get into it, but if he did get into it, he was a much freer, in a much freer atmosphere than any other in England. Of those aristocrats, the old guard of the 18th century, many denied God, many defended Bonaparte, nearly all sneered at the royal family, nor did wealth or birth make any barriers for those once within this singular Whig world. The value of such a frontier between worlds consists in enriching all of them by a kind of process of dialogue and interaction that would be quite impossible within any one of them. The great value of Ireland. Well, in that connection, the famous episode in Macaulay's early life concerned a letter he received from Jeffrey, the editor of the Edinburgh Review, who said, Mr. Macaulay, the more I think, the less I can conceive where you got that style. He got it on the frontier between these two families. It's an interplay between styles. The great value of Ireland in English life appears sufficiently in the work of Bernard Shaw. His play, John Bull's Other Island, is a dramatization, as it were, of the frontiersmanship that Shaw exploited with poetic imagination. Quote, when I say that I am an Irishman, I mean that I was born in Ireland, that my native language is the English of Swift and not the unspeakable jargon of the mid-19th century London newspapers. My extraction is the extraction of most Englishmen. That is, I have no trace in me of the commercially imported North Spanish strain which passes for Aboriginal Irish. I am a genuine, typical Irishman of the Danish, Norman, Cromwellian, and of course Scottish invasions. I am violently and arrogantly Protestant by family tradition, but let no English government therefore counter my allegiance. I am English enough to be an inveterate Republican and a home ruler. It is true that one of my grandfathers was an Orangeman, but then his sister was an abbess, and his uncle, I am proud to say, was hanged <laughs> as a rebel. When I look around me on the hybrid cosmopolitans, slum poison, square pampered, who call themselves Englishmen today and see them bullied by the Irish Protestant garrison as no Bengalee now lets himself be bullied by an Englishman, when I see the Irishman everywhere standing clear-headed, sane, heartily callous, callous to the boy's sentimentalities, susceptibilities that make the Englishman the dupe of every charlatan, an idolater of every numbskull, I perceive that Ireland is the only spot on earth which still produces the ideal Englishman of history. Canada may, this may happen to Canada, as after all we have already, with Raymond Massey, produced the ideal, typical American of all time, Abe Lincoln. <laughs> he concludes, personally, I like Englishmen much better than Irishmen, no doubt because they make more of me, just as many Englishmen like Frenchmen better than Englishmen. But I never think of an Englishman as my countryman. I should as soon think of applying that term to a German, and the English have the same feeling. feeling. When a Frenchman fails to make the distinction, we both feel a certain disparagement involved in the misapprehension. Macaulay, seeing, he goes on, Macaulay, seeing that the Irish had in Swift an author worth stealing, tried to annex him by contending that he must be classed as an Englishman because he was not an Aboriginal self. He might as well have refused the name of Britain to Addison because he did not stain himself blue and attach size to the poles of his sedan chair. In spite of all such trifling with facts, the actual distinction between the idolatrous Englishman and the fact-facing Irishman, of the same extraction though they be, remains to explode those two hollowest of fictions, the fictions, the Irish and the English races. Perhaps an even more striking instance of the operation of frontiersmanship in intensifying human perception and creativity occurs in the career of James Joyce, of whom a fellow Irishman observed not long ago that the oddity of James Joyce seems to me partly that of a prodigious birth out of time, another frontier, an oddity favored certainly but not engendered by the artistic climate of the 20th century. Ireland, owing to her isolation from the European development, also in part, no doubt, to foreign domination, had produced no important body of literature during the Middle Age, an age which in her case has continued almost to the present day. Joyce is Ireland's first great native writer, her Dante or her Chaucer, though expressing his age as every writer should, 
It was also necessary for him to express in his manner those buried ages to achieve a great collective Yeatsian dreaming back. He took with immense seriousness his destiny of forging the uncreated conscience of his race, something which is given only really to the artist to do, so that he had to be by turns a St. Augustine crying aloud his sins, a scholastic glossing on Aquinas, should old Aquinas be forgot, the, the producer himself of a summa, or great synthesis, and finally a Duns Scotus splitting hairs and mangling words. And all the time, he was essentially a humorous, skeptical Dublin observer and every man among artists with a schoolboy love of puns. When Ulysses appeared in 1922, T.S. Eliot wrote in his review, in using the myth, in, in manip manipulating a continuous parallel between contemporaneity and antiquity, Mr. Joyce is pursuing a method which others must pursue after him. That is the parallel between modern Dublin and ancient Ithaca, Homer's world. They will not be imitators any more than the scientist who uses the discoveries of an Einstein in pursuing his own independent further investigations. It is simply a way of controlling, of ordering, of giving shape and significance to the immense panorama of utility and anarchy which is contemporary history. And it is specifically saying here that the only way you can control any very complex anarchic situation is by parallel borders, uh, a border or a frontier. It is a method already adumbrated by Mr. Yates, and the need for which I believe Mr. Yates to have been the first contemporary to be conscious. It is also Mr. Elliot's method, uh, since he is a man from Missouri set up his cabin on the banks of the Thames in 1915, approximately. Uh, an example of premature brain drain. Um, there won't be time to go into that theme, but for anybody who studied frontiers in literature, they'll know the drain is never one in one direction only. Elliot went to England and made visible for the first time to the 20th century English the new world of French literary and artistic discovery. He, the environment of European art of the past decades had become so invisible to the English that it took this American uh, to reveal it by his artistic activities, as it were. Uh, Yeats himself was a great frontiersman. And there is a famous passage in Yeats in which he says that one of the defects of French literature is its lack of double plots or parallel structures without which, he says, you cannot achieve the emotion of multitude. It is by a parallel between two kinds of actions, which Shakespeare frequently uses, that you achieve the emotion of multitude. This is a state in which we live constantly, that is, on the border. We live constantly in two worlds, and we have endless access to this resource which enables us to create an emotion of multitude in a very various patterns. The um, world of Whitman doesn't need very much propping up in order to be seen as a frontier world. Um, his barbaric yop, which he insisted on sounding across the roofs of the world, was very much born on the frontier and directed to the frontier. He was also the author of that famous phrase, Passage to India. He has a poem of that title. And this is another kind of frontier famous in the work of E.M. Forster. The Passage to India, as a, uh, as a parallel between East and West, a novel whose main action is parallel at East and West, is by far his greatest work, and it derives its greatness from this amazing parallel of actions that are seemingly totally unconnected. There doesn't have to be any connection between the actions, long as they continue parallel to one another. What Columbus, as it were, failed to discover, namely a passage to India, these artists did work at. Was it here uh, that Adley Stevenson said on this platform, Columbus went too far. 
The sense of the creative possibilities of the frontiers, personal or national, is as prominent in the work of Yeats as in anybody. The famous observation of Yeats is that the borders of our minds are ever-shifting and that many minds can flow into one another, as it were, and create or reveal a single mind, a single energy. Also, that the borders of our memories are as shifting and that our memories are a part of one great memory, the memory of nature herself. This great mind and great memory can be evoked by symbols, by artists, in other words. And I think that Canada has contributed some amazing frontiersmen of whom surely Norther Fry is as extraordinary as any with his frontiersmanship between the world of literature and the unconscious. This has given him a world position, and it is a very much a frontier activity. One of the most breathtaking frontiersmen of culture was Edmund Burke, whose 18th century view of the Revolutionary War in America anticipated Harold Innes's conclusion to his history of the fur trade in Canada. Innes argued that the war was basically a conflict between the fur traders and the settlers. The fur trade interest in the East naturally regarded settlement as a threat to the trapping lines and the fur supplies. The East had always feared the result of an unregulated advance of the frontier and was tried to check and guide it, the English authorities would have checked settlement at the headwaters of the Atlantic, allowed the savages to enjoy their deserts in quiet, lest the peltry trade should decrease. Well, this behavior called out Burke's protest as follows. That is, the Atlantic seaboard entrepreneurs were prepared to call off the development of America in the name of the fur trade. Burke protested. If you stopped your grants, what would be the consequence? The people would occupy without grants. They have already so occupied in many places. You cannot station garrisons in every part of these deserts. If you drive the people from one place, they'll carry on their annual tillage and remove with their flocks and herds to another. Many of the people in the back settlements are already little attached to particular situations. Already they have topped the Appalachian Mountains. From thence they behold before them an immense plain, one vast, rich, level meadow, a square of 500 miles. He was not entirely correctly informed. Over this they would wander without a possibility of restraint. They would change their manners or their habits of life, would soon forget a government by which they were disowned, and would become hordes of English Tartars, pouring down upon your unfortified frontiers a fierce and irresistible cavalry and become master of your governors and your counselors, your collectors and controllers. Burke saw centuries ahead, as frontiersmen often do. A frontiersman of a very different kind was James Boswell, who invaded the British metropolis to obtain the scalp of the great panjandrum of English letters. Boswell and Johnson never ceased to dialogue back and forth across the frontier. Boswell would say, but Scotland, sir, has many noble wild prospects. And Johnson, yes, sir. And the noblest prospect any Scot ever sees is the high road that leads to England. <laughs> the Scot in England is transformed as radically as Shaw claims for the Irishman in England. Surrounded by staid and unimaginative humanity, the Scot in England becomes daring, vigorous, and efficient. In Canada, in a more inspiring setting, he is inclined to lethargy and caution lest he upset. So ideal a milieu. <laughs> in Scotland, the Scot is quite another person. John Wilson, and I had a delightful conversation one day with John Wilson of the African Institute of London University, speaking of frontiers. He's a Scot who spent much of his life in Africa trying to teach uh, natives to read by means of film. He gave up after 20 years and taught them to read their letters so that they could see the film. He, he discovered they couldn't see films until they'd learned to read and write. But John Wilson said that it's true the frontier turns the Scot into an artist, an entrepreneur. But at home, Wilson pointed out to me that he's a very unimaginative bureaucrat. <laughs> 
the Scot at home is not the Scot who created the frontiers of the world. The frontiers have many patterns that are often difficult to discern. The frontier in American history became visible as a social and geographic factor only with the advent of the telegraph, which eliminated geography. I'm grateful to our Alexander lecturer, Professor Kermot, who pointed out that in 1867, uh, the telephone was invented, but also Das Kapital was uh, published. Uh, as a frontier event, that's rather a memorable, uh, something for Expo to play up, maybe. <laughs> but with the coming of the telegraph, the whole environment, the old environment, went inside and became much more discernible when it had this new surround, as it were. And uh, if the railway created a kind of unity in Canada, a kind of continuity in space, the CBC has a new frontier in space and time. It tends to eliminate the pattern of uh, geographic pattern of the railway in favor of a, a very much more massive and at the same time more discontinuous pattern of electric information. We have uh, yet to uh, discern the features of electric environments. They are so little like any of the earlier environments in the world that uh, we have yet to learn really how to cope with them at all. Harold Innes became keen, keenly aware of the oral tradition in the ancient world uh, as a result of his studies in the modern world. That is, modern anthropologists dealing as they do with non-literate societies have made our contemporaries specially aware of the integrating and unifying force of oral culture. With this awareness has come our knowledge of the dis disintegrating power of civilization. Whereas Rousseau in the highly civilized society of the 18th century had come to value the integral qualities of primitive, primitive life, we have come to understand in detail the operation of those factors that enable civilized values to permeate oral situations. It is much less feasible to observe the factors now operating upon ourselves, factors that are creating a new oral culture overlaying our inherited civilization. A civilization is, is always based upon some written form. Professor W.P. Easterbrook, who is spending the year in Taz Tanzania, is very much aware of these matters, and he often drops notes uh, portraying the amazing differences between uh, these oral and semi-literate people and ourselves. Uh, he says, for example, jokes as such are very rare over here, but uh, the element of fun is everywhere. Delight in the quick thrust, the parry and return. This breaks through at every meeting, no matter how serious the subject under consideration. There is no bitterness or malice in the delightful play of wits, no resentment when a thrust strikes home. There is a lightness of touch that most of us have lost, and I do hope that with development it will not be lost here. But uh, the qualities of an oral society are, I think, becoming more evident to us in the electronic age with a tremendous increase of, well, professional wits and entertainers. The Bob Hopes and so on are basically oral types, not to mention the Jimmy Durantics. But the, um, it is much less feasible to observe the factors now operating upon ourselves, uh, factors that create a new oral culture. We're all familiar with the great flood of sounds that environ our world, but we're not necessarily familiar with the fact that electronic simultaneity in all at once is itself auditory in structure, even when there's nothing to be heard. That is, auditory space or auditory effects are from all directions at once, uh, as in this uh, auditorium. Uh, whereas the visual world is not from all directions at once, the civilized world deals with one a thing at a time. Um, our new electric power enables us to put the human unconscious 
as it were, outside as an unintentional environment that we experience unconsciously. A new bridge or frontier is thus created between the conscious and the unconscious, one of the anarchic and uh, to any adult, one of the utterly confusing things about our time is this sudden appearance of a world in which everything that man ever was or ever knew is outside as part of the human environment. This is really very much like the unconscious. And to confront the unconscious as an environmental fact is to seem to confront or encounter anarchy. Our teenagers uh, respond to this unconscious with delight as a kind of Disneyland of uh, imaginative effects. Um, our teenagers have been called the last generation, meaning not lost, but nor last in the sense of never anymore, but last in the sense of ultimately summing up all other generations at all. The deep interest of Harold Innes, of Harold Innes in the interplay across the frontier of the written and the oral forms of human experience may well have inspired his old friend Eric Havelock to make a splendid and unique study of the oral tradition in ancient Greece. Eric Havelock's preface to Plato was a study of the social frontiers between the written and the oral traditions and their effects on the shaping of human per perception and behavior in the ancient world. Quoting him for a moment, to repeat then, in an oral cult culture, the hoarded usages of society also uh, as tend to assume the guise of hoarded techniques. The poets, in that sense, become the tribal encyclopedists of the time of the culture, and the tribal encyclopedia does not just contain thoughts or observations, but also techniques about how to conduct society, how to govern it, how to control it. Hence, uh, he argues, hence Plato's hostility to the poets as educators, he being a new type of educator. This is a Havelock's thesis in that book, that the, the poets were the first educators of Greece, in, they were the educational establishment, bitterly resented by the new revolutionaries coming in with the written word, the Platos and others, and that the war of Plato's famous war on the poets is simply a war of one educator against the educational establishment. But that's only incidental to the theme of the book. The theme of the book is that an oral society packs, records in its oral encyclopedia, it records techniques for operating a society. And I think you'll find that the teenagers today tend to take that outlook on even such things as the hit parade. They seem to regard it as absolutely indispensable for survival. Uh, op it's operational. It isn't entertainment at all. It's part of the way of life. It is a needed and central fact. Uh, these, you know, our teenagers are all behaving like members of a, an ancient oral culture. And surrounded as they are by rather uh, civilized people, <laughs> recently civilized, uh, no, but there's a huge confusion then between these two conditions. The most striking example, he said, furnished in the first book of the Iliad, of this type of operational wisdom, uh, is that of the practices of seamanship a craft central to Greek civilization at all periods. The poet's narrative is so composed that opportunity is afforded for a sea voyage. The girl, if she is to be restored to her father's shrine, must be transported on shipboard. This becomes the occasion for recapitulating some standardized operational procedures which are spelled out in four distinct passages forming a progressive pattern as follows. I, it's, I'll only uh, read the last one. Uh, let us advisedly gather and thereupon make a hecatomb. Let us sit, set upon the deck, crises of the fair cheeks. Let us embark, and one man as captain, a man of counsel, there must be. In our own world, <clears throat> the fragments of the oral tradition exist mainly in religious ritual and liturgy, which have taken on a new significance and relevance in our electronic time. In fact, we are in a sense playing backwards this process described in the preface to Plato. We are moving from the written to the oral at a much higher speed than the Greeks ever disintegrated their oral culture by means of the written word. 
It is a great shock to many to discover that the demands of oral culture are deep and involving compared to the patterns of written and literary culture. When our children encounter the old literary establishment of classified knowledge, they feel rejected and ejected by <coughs> its superficiality. <clears throat> Incongruously, we classify them as dropouts. Introducing the mass media, the Massey Report records, quote, before proceeding to the problems of broadcasting, of moving pictures and other mass media in Canada, we think it worthwhile to point out that about one half of the Canadian population was born earlier than 1923, and that most of these older members of our population spent their formative years in a society where radio was unknown, where the moving picture was an exceptional curiosity, and where, as a consequence, the cultural life of most communities centered about the church, the school, the local library, and the local newspaper. It is probably true, for example, that most Canadians now in their 30s or older will recall that the church organist and the church choir provided much of the music of their earlier years. And more often than not, the organist in English-speaking Canada was from the old country trained in the English tradition of organ and choral music. The great musical events of the year were usually the concerts given by the local church choirs. Although the radio was vastly, has vastly increased the size of listening audiences, we must not forget that long before its day, there flourished in the towns and cities of Canada a vigorous musical life, uh, that the musical tastes of a considerable part of our population were in large measure formed by the well-trained musicians who came to us. This is, in effect, uh, a statement that um, traditional music offers a kind of oral encyclopedia, a tribal encyclopedia, was basically a, a, a form of mass media uh, that uh, the Massey Report has found more acceptable than the new mass media. But it's an interesting sidelight or insight to say that the tradition of church music really was a kind of corporate communal art uh, shared by all and that bound uh, the community together. The principal theme of the Double Hook by Sheila Watson is the effect of people in a simple frontier community in British Columbia trying to create a sort of unity in their inner lives by forming images of social cohesion and communication, quote, his mind sifted ritual phrases, some half forgotten. You're welcome. Put your horses in. Pull up. Ave Maria. Benedictus Fructus Ventris. Intro Evo. What all of us do, only the artist makes visible. The ordinary procedures and environmental patterns of a society don't become visible until the artist creates this counter environment of art objects. This is the frontier problem that uh, I think relates to Canada's position as a, a frontier country, giving Canada a kind of world art role in making visible the vast man-made American environment that is becoming a world environment. I don't know whether that makes much sense at first, but as the United States becomes a world environment, some means is needed to make it visible and capable of appraisal, appreciation, and criticism that only the artist can do. And I think Canada is essentially in this artistic role. It isn't the sort of thing that can be casually uh, talked about in a, a large public occasion, but it needs chatting about and, and sifting and thinking. Art makes the corporate and communal accessible to the individual whose task it is to assimilate the tradition, to modify it in relation to the new situations that are continuously forming. The artist does this by creating counter-environments as mirrors of the present. Emily Carr's paintings made accessible to us all the British Columbia experience. For the first time, for many of us, as it were, the, the group of seven made Canada visible. Now, there's a very peculiar example of a Canadian role in this matter in the States. 
There is a great oral tradition related to the name and figure of Paul Bunyan and his ox, blue ox, Babe. This uh, great French-Canadian oral tradition swept through the Cana American frontier um, at the turn of the last century and um, is not really much known to Canadians, but is very vividly known to Americans, at least in the Midwest. I encountered the Paul Bunyan story and adventures and hyperboles and uh, fantasies uh, first when, uh, at w Madison, Wisconsin, where they were very prevalent. And uh, Wisconsin was a great logging territory, and Paul Bunyan was a French-Canadian logger, and all these wild stories concern these superhuman feats that he and his ox performed in the logging communities. The um, oral tradition, the, this huge epic oral tradition of Paul Bunyan seems to be a natural result of the frontier meeting of two worlds, it tends to create this emotion of multitude and, and bigness, um, which I mentioned earlier. And perhaps uh, the most stri striking example at all is Ned Pratt or E.J. Pratt's poetry. His epics, his, his cachalots, his uh, epics about the great uh, effort at creating the C uh, CPR, the last spike poem, the Titanic poem, Brave Wolf and his brethren all, uh, brethren, all these epics are very much frontier poems, the meeting of worlds, uh, the artistic effort to make visible uh, two worlds at once, frontier worlds. Um, yes, Ned Pratt is essentially a, an oral poet, as anybody uh, could tell from meeting him and hearing his tales and anecdotes. Uh, and it's, uh, he's our English equivalent, as it were, of the French-Canadian Paul Bunyan. I mean, our English and literate equivalent of the Canadian oral Paul Bunyan. The, um, the artist is by nature a boundary hopper and a claim jumper. Let me suggest that Canada as a counter environment to the world environment created by the U.S may not only be the means of creating a colossal artistic vision of the present and the meaning of the U.S. and the world, but that Canada may well incur the deep unpopularity that results from, from performing this necessary function. Um, the artist as a sort of frontier uh, boundary hopper uh, has often been regarded as a kind of enemy of society and also because he makes things, he points out things that many people would rather not notice. One way to grasp the importance of this artistic vision can be shown by relating our situation to comparable patterns of culture in other times. That is why I'd like to take a moment to relate our situation today to those crucial developments in ancient Greece which led to the founding of the Western tradition. In a basic sense, we are retracing in the present age many of the cultural stages that men traversed at that time, and thus making that period of the world very visible to us. This retracing is in its turn manifested in another pattern of events, of events closely related to our history, in which we see the United States performing in Asia the same frontier push against the tribal man that we associate with Europe and the beginnings of American history. This is altogether so obvious that uh, apparently it is not ordinarily verbalized, but that what is now going on in Vietnam is very much a repeat of what went on on the American frontier for centuries. Um, and it may be merely a sort of automatic gesture of uh, unconscious frontiersmen going through the old motions of being frontiersmen without noticing what they're doing. To be on the frontier then between worlds, living in divided and distinguished worlds, as Sir Thomas Brown said, the human condition, whether geographically or historically, is to have a keener vision of present events than is available to those directly involved in them. The name Keenly Side was given, I am told, to Scots who dwelt by Hadrian's Wall, a frontier. They appear to have been accredited with a more than ordinary degree of awareness. Fifth century Athens was the first human community to experience the shift 
from oral to visual and literate culture, it was the first human community to detribalize and to disintegrate its oral tradition. It was the first to discover the privileges and the anxieties of individual identity. And as you are familiar, uh, altogether, our time is obsessed with this problem of identity and the quest for identity. Um, but for the Greeks, the discovery of individual identity was terrifying and altogether shattering, as, in, as it was dramatized, for example, in Oedipus Rex. Uh, it wasn't a, a very welcome experience to discover what Oedipus discovered, that all men were bound so intimately to one another as to be, in effect, living in a perpetual incest. Uh, this uh, was one of the immediate discoveries of civilized man when he faced his tribal heritage. The uh, present century is the first in which detribalized Westerners have begun to experience the reverse shift from written to oral culture. Today we experience that kind of bewilderment that ensues when an individual and private culture begins to resume an involvement in the corporate and collective modes of awareness with all the depth and commitment that implies. Our most immediate experience of this takeover of individual culture by the corporate and collective vision of tribal man is in our own homes. The present generation gap between teenagers and their parents is a major manifestation of a technological gap between the mechanical and the electric cultures. While we exert ourselves to confer Western technology and patterns on the Oriental world and backward countries everywhere, we are less likely to notice that the inner trip of Oriental culture has grown apace in our own society thanks to the operation of electric technology on our sensory order. As we westernize the Orient and Africa, we have been even more successful in easternizing and tribalizing ourselves. Westernizing is a process that we can easily perceive in the rearview mirror. We naturally feel at home with that process after 2,500 years of cultivating it. The tribalizing process, the inner trip, the depth involvement in the experience of a unified human family, this is something of which we have had no experience for many centuries. It is a process that is located so entirely in the present that it does not appear at all in the rearview mirror which we habitually look to for reassurance and nostalgic orientation. Well, I'm going to stop right there because my, this uh, brings up my theme for tomorrow. Having talked tonight about divided, uh, a divided country, as it were, or culture, tomorrow we will have, uh, take the time to discuss a unified one. Thank you very much. Canada, a borderline case. The first of the Marfleet lectures delivered by Marshall McLuhan at the University of Windsor. The subject of Professor McLuhan's lectures is Canada in the Electronic Age. And next Friday, the second of these lectures entitled Towards an Inclusive Consciousness. The introduction to the lecture tonight was by Dr. Eugene McNamara of the Department of English, the University of Windsor, who is presently editing a selection of literary essays by Marshall McLuhan. After the lecture next week, Dr. McNamara, in a few summary remarks, discusses some of the ideas and their presentation, which comprise what is called, in the vernacular, McLuhanism. Ken Haslam speaking. <laughs>